Romans chapter 15. And we find Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, cha uh, verse number, uh, we'll just start at verse 1. It says, When then, uh, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves, let everyone must please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of, the, of them that reproached thee fell on me. And it says, here's verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Verse 4 again, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Let's pray. Lord, thank you this day for you and uh, bless the service tonight. And uh, we'll ask the psalm in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Um... My brother, instead of, instead of using it as a joke tonight, I'll, I'll tell a little story about my brother. He is a, an aspiring pilot. He took ground school a couple years ago, and now he's it's, it's kind of, kind of hit, a, hit a wall on that. Maybe he's planning on going back and doing more, but I don't know. But he took ground school for uh, being, getting a pilot's license, and when I wrote this on, on the board, he knew what I was writing. On the board, you'll see spatial disorientation. And in the world of, of general aviation, did you learn much about spatial disorientation in ground school, Christian? Oh, yeah. Did you? Okay. So what you, you may ask what spatial disorientation is. Well, I'm glad you asked because I got a definition of it. Spatial disorientation of an aviator is the inability to determine angle, altitude, or speed. It is most critical at night or in poor weather when there is no visible horizon, since vision, now take, take, take note of this, since vision is the dominant sense for orientation, auditory system in, in the vestibular inner ear system for coordinating movement with balance can also create illusionary non-visual sensations as can other sensory receptors located in the skin, muscles, tendons, and joints. So what spatial orientation is, is when a pilot, an untrained pilot, where they might not be instrument rated to fly a plane to where they're only supposed to be flying a plane when it's good weather, and they can see the horizon, they can see the ground, it's not at night, they, they're, they're, they're flying under, what is it called, Christian, VFR? They're not IFR, they're not IFR rated, they're VFR rated. Uh, visual flight rules. And it says right there, spatial disorientation, it all keys off of, like it says there, it is most critical at night or in poor weather when there is no visible horizon since vision, since vision is the dominant sense for orientation. But the thing is, is when, what happens is, is pilots have to train themselves that when they, to fight against spatial disorientation, and they say there's, there's case after case, if you look on the internet, of, of plane crashes that they determine were caused by the pilots getting spatial disorientation. Uh, one of the more famous ones was back when I was a kid at the time, was uh, JFK Jr., John F. Kennedy Jr., was flying a small plane to uh, Martha's Vineyard with his wife and I believe his sister-in-law and crashed, and they believed that he was... He had his pilot's license, but I don't think he was uh, IFR rated as far as had had the had the um, oh, my is blank. had the qualifications to fly by his instruments, and he didn't. And he ended up crashing the plane, and then killed all three of them. And they determined the the uh, the national oh, what what is that called? The NTSB determined that it was spatial disorientation. He got he got his his brain his senses were not giving the right feedback to what he perceived the plane was doing, and it went into what they call it the the corkscrew death or whatever it is. But what we find here is is is.
flying a plane or having a pilot's license is is a is a thing that you can do in this world to where you I mean pilots you don't see many blind pilots. They they determine a lot on their sight. And even even if they're rated for, for instrument flight rules, they have to they have to learn to to go to fly by their instruments. There's actually even I've seen uh, hoods where if a pilot's training for their to get their 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 instrument flight rules, their certification, it's like a big, it's almost like a bonnet thing that goes over their eyes to where they can't see out the front of the windshield. They're only supposed to be flying by their instruments. And so and it's the same thing in the Christian life. You were told there is no, there is no uh the, they're, they're, I mean, there's there's a lot of Christians these days that they live their Christian life by VFR, visual flight rules. They're, fly, they're, they're living their Christian life on visual flight rules. When they were never, according to the Bible, you were never supposed to do that. It says right here, and that's where this verse comes in. It says, For what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You were, you were never, as a Christian, you were never supposed to, you are never supposed to fly your plane, your Christian life. We'll, 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 we'll use the example of your Christian life, we'll, we'll turn it into an airplane. You were never supposed to fly your Christian life by visual flight rules. But probably, I don't know, 70, 75% of Christians these days they're living their lives by visual flight rules. I mean, the Bible specifically says, what did, what did that spatial disorder, what did the, what did the, uh, the, uh, the definition of spatial disorientation say it was? It says, it's uh, the inability to determine angle, altitude, or speed is most critical at night or in poor weather when there is no visible horizon, since vision is the dominant sense for orientation. You are never, as a Christian, supposed to have sight, your vision, as your dominant sense for orientation. Yep. And you say, well, where does it say that? Well, let's take a look. Uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5. It's pretty simple. This is The Apostle Paul says this. The Apostles and the Gentiles says this. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6, it says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Look at verse 7. And in parentheses. I love it. It's in parentheses. Probably, probably the, 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 the most important verse for a new Christian. And Paul just kind of, it's, it's almost, it's almost not, not an afterthought. I know it's supposed to be there. But maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's because that Look at the end of it. There's a semicolon and then the parentheses, the smiley face. So what Paul's saying is, we walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. And gives you the smiley face. Because he knows, he probably knew that 75% of Christians wouldn't, wouldn't believe it. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Christians live their lives in, in, in visual flight rules. When they were supposed to, they're supposed to be instrument rated. And you say, and, and the thing is, is with the Christian life, it's backwards than the than the pilot's license thing. It's it's more difficult. You when you first get your pilot's license, when you first get your pilot's license, you're flying. The first thing you do is you fly vi uh, visual flight rules, and then you go back and you get instrument rated to where you know you know how to use the instruments. But the thing is, with the Christian life, it's backwards. You say, well, what's the instruments of the Christian life? Well. It's sitting in your lap right now. Amen. As a Christian, you were never supposed to. You were never supposed to start visual flight rules. Yep. You were supposed to get saved, become a Christian, become a pilot, start your Christian life, and you were supposed to go right to instrument flight rules. But what happens is, is maybe, and maybe you know, maybe in your Christian life you didn't have have someone that you know you got saved and, and maybe uh, got away from the Lord or got saved and didn't have someone around that can teach you teach you about that to where down the road, down the road, 10, 15 years later, you become, you realize you've been living your Christian life and then something happens. Uh, doubt comes in to where you, you start putting, putting your feelings ahead of what the Bible says because you've been living, you've been living in Christian, in Christian VFR land for so long 
that you don't know how to use the instruments anymore. You can, I mean, there's, there's, there's thousands of Christians in America today that maybe some of them won't admit it, but there's thousands of Christians in America today that, that doubt whether they're saved or not. I mean, I, I, I've, gone, I've gone through periods of doubt. I've gone, I've gone for the last, I'll admit this, for the last three years, I've probably felt saved for a total of, I don't know, a week in the last three years. I mean, that's the thing is, is people get based on, based on what they feel is how they think that, well, I feel this way, so, you know, this is how it must be. To where you people get so off course to where they, they, they get so used to finding that VFR that when, when, like it says, when darkness comes, just like that, that, uh, um, that description of spatial disorientation, when darkness comes or bad weather, um, there it is. And I'm not saying that, you know, in your Christian life you're going to, I mean, you could crash, but I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation or something. But the Bible says, what Paul says is you become cast away. You become good for nothing. To where you become, you become a Christian that's living by sight so long that whatever comes into your life, the devil just sits back and, and he doesn't even have to, he goes, I don't even have to aim at this guy anymore. The fiery darts of the wicked. He goes, watch this. That, you know, it's gonna hit. It's gonna hit him, and, it, and it's gonna take him down. The devil get. The devil gets so used to you being so so sensitive to your feelings about things that he can just launch those fiery darts at you, and he doesn't even have to look. Hey guys, watch this behind the back. You know, behind the barn. You know, it's gonna take him out. Like I said, like I said, you know, you bait, like like flying VFR, basing everything on feelings. There's gonna come a day when it's not gonna work anymore. And what we have to do is we have to switch over. We have to switch over to IFR, instrument flight rules. And what's the instrument? The Word of God. It doesn't base on your feelings. So not only is this spatial disorientation, the whole name of this is Christian spatial disorientation. You have Christians who never learned to base base everything on the Word of God and 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 not base things on feelings. Like I said, you might wake up tomorrow and not feel saved. But the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You might have a, and this is this was the biggest thing. This is the biggest thing. This was the biggest thing for me, to where even not only feelings, not only feelings, but what other preachers say. You can sit in a sermon where a preacher might say, "Well, you know, when I got saved, I did this, this, and this, and I saw a great light, and and now, you know, I haven't done anything. I, you know, I've done whatever I wanted. I don't have any desire to sin." Uh, and if and if you don't if you didn't get that you didn't get what I got. What you have to watch out for is personal testimonies are not the gospel. And that's what people even preachers these days they get in this habit of their their testimony must be the gospel. Amen. Or even it comes to the it comes to the it comes to the point where these evangelists go around and because they want to see something happen while they're preaching. They try to preach people out of their salvation. See, salvation is so simple that people, people get saved, and like I said, they don't grow. They're still on BFR. They're, they're just walking by sight. They're not doing what Paul said. It says, when we walk by faith, not by sight. They're living, they're living by their feelings to where they can listen to a preacher who's not, who's not preaching the Bible, but preaching to get, preaching to get results preaching to see something happen, and they can get talked out of their salvation. Salvation is simple. Too simple. Paul said to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. You realize you're a sinner. You realize that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. And you put your faith in that to get you to heaven. See, everybody in here Everybody in here is trusting something to get them to heaven. And it's trusting in the right thing that gets you there. You, can, you trust Jesus. The Bible, 
not well, this isn't a Bible verse, but this is this is how simply it is, simple it is. If you want to go to heaven, trust Jesus Christ. If you want to go to hell, trust something else. That's how simple it is. And so, but what happens is, is we, we get saved, we get saved, if you're saved, you get saved, and, and if you don't grow, you, you go on through your life and you never you never grow, you never get in the word, the word, you never get on the instrument flight rules that you were supposed to be on from the beginning. Because it, especially if a new Christian, a new Christian can't go by their feelings, just like a just like a mature Christian can't go by their feelings, but even more so for a new Christian, because they don't even know what they don't they don't know up from down. They got to go by what the Bible says. Uh, turn to uh, turn to uh, Galatians five, and so what happens in, in Christian spatial disorientation is uh, because because Christians don't read the Bible or they don't get in the Bible where they're living their life by what the Bible says. What happens is is when you get saved, you don't lose you don't lose your your fleshly nature. The Bible says, uh, if you say you have no, it's not like when you get saved, you your sin nature is eradicated and you feel holy the rest of your life. The Bible says uh, in First John, if we say we have no sin, uh, what is it? How's it go? If you say we, have, we we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. So what happens is, is because just like in Christian spatial disorientation, what happens is, is we get Christians get to where they don't, they forget. That they have two natures in them. Galatians chapter 5. I'm sorry. Go to Romans 7. Preacher or something that that we trust, we you know we listen to or whatever that wow well, you know the way they preach and stuff they must you know they're they're really holy people. Well, I would I would dare I would dare to to say that the Apostle Paul was probably the best Christian as far as as far as uh, the way he lived his life, his testimony, probably the best Christian that ever lived as far as keeping his life right as much as he could. But look at what he said. Uh, verse 14 of chapter Romans 7, it says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent in the law that it is good. Now then it is no more that I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. And so what he's saying here is you have two natures. And what happens is, is people forget that to where, I just read a bit, it was, it's funny that I, was, I, I picked up a book this afternoon that Colleen had, had ordered. It was my money, of course. <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay. Marriage counseling. Yeah, it turned into marriage counseling. <laughs> and what it was is, it's uh, it was Chick Publications. It was uh, the next step. It was a book for new Christians. And I read this. I read this thing, and it was. It 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 showed how I I told I told my mom before the service. I said I see my myself in the book about three or four times. It was telling new Christians that okay, now you need to pray. And it said, but remember, be careful, uh, just remember this, that when you get down to pray, the devil's not going to like it. And it had a little thing that showed, you're going you're gonna to get down to pray and nasty thoughts are going to come to your mind. You're, you're going to be praying and nasty thoughts are going to come to your mind. And if you didn't know, if you don't know that because you're saved, you're in a, a spiritual battle with the devil, that the devil doesn't want you to be down praying, 
But the devil, like I said, is going to fire them fiery darts in your mind, and you have to, to, to plead the blood of Jesus Christ against him. Amen. But what can happen is if you don't know that, if you're flying, if you're flying by visual flight rules, you'll sit there and be praying and think, how could I be saved and think what I just thought? Hmm. Now, and maybe that's never happened to you, but it happens to me on a regular basis. Because the devil, he, what the, there's an old saying that says you're not responsible for the birds flying over your head, but you are responsible if they make a nest in your hair. Yep. Amen. And so countless times I've been praying or reading the Bible or in some of the nastiest thoughts have come into my mind. And like I said, if, if, if you don't know, if you're, fly, if you're living your Christian life by visual flight rules, by feelings, by sight, you'll sit there and think, how could I be saved and think that? And the devil goes, yes. Because how are you going to pray then? I don't even know if I'm saved. How am I supposed to pray now? How, how, am, I, how am I supposed to be saved and have those thoughts? Hmm. Or like, like the Apostle Paul says here, you have two natures to where you feel like, and in, in, in David Peacock, who's a pastor in, in uh, Florida, he says the two natures to where you feel there's such a battle going on, you know, pastor, why do I feel schizophrenic? He says, because you are. You've got a fleshly nature and a spiritual nature. Look at, look at down, look right where we are in Romans 7, verse 24, it says, Paul says, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And just like he said back, just like he said back uh, in verse 15 where he says, What I do, I don't do what I should do, and I do what I shouldn't do. It's, it, and he says, to, to will is present with me. Where does it say that? Where does it say that? One of that verses. Verse 18. For I know that in me that my flesh will live in Yeah, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I find that happens to me all the time to where I'll be at work and I think, you know what? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, or throughout the week, you know, this, this week I'm going to, I'm going to do, I'm going to give a, I'm going to witness to him. When he, when he talks to me, I'm going to give it a track. You know, I've got that. You, you have that desire. You have that desire for spiritual things. But when push comes to shove, when the chance comes, you can't find how to do it. Just like it says there, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. And that's the, that's the spirit. That's the Holy Spirit in you is when you think of that, I need to do that. Yes, I'm going to witness to him. When I get the next chance I do, I'm going to witness to him. And then he stands in front of you. Someone stands in front of you, gives you the perfect opening, makes a comment, and gives you the perfect opening to witness to them. And you go, uh, yeah. All right. We'll see you later. Bye. And then you walk away feeling like garbage. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. In 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, oh, that, we already went there, I'm sorry. Uh, and so, like I said, Christian spatial disorientation, it comes down to this. It comes down to first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. You either walk by faith or you walk by sight. And what the Bible says here is you weren't supposed, you were never, Paul never, even the new Christian said, you know, walk by, like, like getting your pilot's license. You, you fly, you fly VFR for a while and then once you get, once you get, uh, 
once you get good enough and get instrument trained, then, then we can start, you know, you can start using instruments. That's not how the Christian life works. You start out with the instruments and you stay with the instruments, the scriptures. Amen. And there's an example, there's an example in, in the Gospel of John, which I always like this one. Because it represented, it represented what, what happens in my life all the time. It's uh, John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4. John, uh, John chapter 4, verse 46, it says, So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And, and so this, what happens is, is uh, I looked this up, because I preached this in the back of the kids a long time ago, about this man. Uh, Cana of Galilee and Capernaum, it's about, it was either a day or a day, it was like two days journey as far as walking. It was, it was like, I think it was, I looked it up, it was, from, it was the same distance from here to Midland, which is like 40 miles. And they didn't have cars back then. And they walked, they walked everywhere. And so Jesus, this man comes to Jesus. It says, when he heard that Jesus would come out of Judea in the Galilee, uh, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the nobleman says, Basically, well, okay, Lord, I don't need a sign. Come down ere my child die. The nobleman said, saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And look what it says. The man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. So he comes to Jesus. He, he walks 40 miles to find Jesus because his son is sick, shows up, and, and, I mean, if I was, if it was me, if I walked 40 miles and I knew, I knew, you know, I'm all the way there, all the way there, I don't know if he's dead or not. I don't know, he, it says he's sick, he's sick unto death. So he travels, how long would it take to walk 40 miles? At least a day, day, day and a half, two days. I mean, it's an overnight journey. So he walks to Galilee, finds Jesus, and if I was the guy, and had heard of what Jesus had been doing, and doing all these signs and miracles, I'd say, hey, Jesus, you know, I believe who you are. I believe you can heal my son. I need you to come. I need you to come with me and heal him. And Jesus says, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the guy goes, okay, I don't need a sign then, but I need something. Because, you know, you need to come with me. Uh, come down here, my child died. Jesus saith unto him, go thy way. Thy son liveth, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. So Jesus says to him, doesn't, Jesus doesn't go with him. Jesus doesn't go with him. He tells the man, your son liveth. Go that way, thy son liveth. He believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. He turned around. He never said another word to Jesus that's recorded here. He turned around and started walking back 40 miles uh, to Capernaum. And so I told the kids back there, so here this guy is, he's walking, starts walking back 40 miles. It's going to take a day, a day and a half, two days maybe. He's probably booking it, so maybe shorter. But he probably had to camp out one night. And so let's say that this was, let's say that this is in the middle of the day and, and he, took, he gets to Jesus and Jesus says, go thy way, thy son liveth. And so here the man's halfway back at Capernaum. He's probably got to make camp for the night, sitting around the campfire and he's looking at that campfire. And this is before cell phones. He don't even know, he, his son, he's thinking his son might be dead before he even got to Jesus. And what... What most people in this situation would do is, especially me, I'd sit there and go, he said, he said my son liveth. But I better go back and double check. I better go back and talk to Jesus. Or I can just see the devil sitting on his shoulder that night and saying, he's there, you know, what, 
He didn't even do a, he didn't even do a sign out. You didn't see no sign. Did you get a did you get a tingly feeling that your son was that your son liveth that when he said that your son liveth to go, to go home to, you know there was no great sign he just said some words you're going to get home and your son's going to be dead but it doesn't say it doesn't say that the nobleman turned around and had to go back to Jesus for a sign and it says as in verse 51 as he was now going down his servants met him told him saying thy son liveth and then he says, okay, he lives. He goes, so then he inquired of the hour when he began to amend. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. What's the seventh hour? Seven, seven. Uh, seven on the six. Huh? Seventh hour, that'd be uh, seven hours after 6 a.m. So it was at 12, 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So yeah. Jesus said, thy son liveth at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. The man had to walk 40 miles back. So that he was at least, he was at least, he had to, he had to camp overnight on the way back. I wouldn't, I wouldn't suspect someone walking all night. Maybe he did. But I'm saying he, it took him probably, I mean, what's the average walk? Three miles an hour. Three miles an hour. So you're, you're talking 12 hours, maybe a little more. A 12-hour walk back. Based on, he had to do that walk based on the word that Jesus said. And I can just imagine the mental torment on the way back. He's thinking, he's already dead. This is not, you know, I didn't, I didn't get a sign. I just, what, what do you mean? I just, I, you know, I, I believe, I, it says he believed the word. He All he had to do was believe the word. And he got back and his son lived. And it was at, he looked back and asked the servants when he started men. And it was the same hour that Jesus had spoken that. And you say, well, apply that to my life. Well, you get saved. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Uh, it, says, it says that for if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Where does it say that? It says it in a book. It's words in a book. So here you go, you just, when you got saved, what you did is you bet, you bet your soul on a book. And you started walking home. And during that walk home, all you've got to rely on, don't rely on your feelings. All you had to do, like that nobleman, all you have, all you have to rely on, just like that nobleman, is the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. So all you've got to all you've got to rely on is the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. Spoken unto you. What did he say? That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. So just like just like every Christian should do, the nobleman was smart enough. He was flying by instrument flight rules, not by visual flight rules. And you'll say, you'll say, well, you know, well, I mean, a pilot that learns visual or instrument flight rules, there's instruments that go wrong. I mean, you can, you know, a, a artificial horizon gets screwed up or an alt, altimeter gets messed up. I mean, what are you gonna do with that? Well, you're gonna die then. Because you can't go by, if you can't, if your instruments screw up, uh, then I guess uh, it's curtains for you. And you say, well, what if I'm betting my soul on the Bible? What if the Bible's not true? Well, the Bible addresses that. In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, it gives you the gospel by which you are saved. How you are saved is by what 1 Corinthians 15 says here. The gospel, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, now that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And it says, if you drop down, 
To verse 12 it says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then, Christ, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is, Christ, then, Christ, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. So Paul says... If it's not true, the Bible says about itself, if it's not true, well, then you're going to hell. That's what it says. It says, the, it says the gospel by which you are saved is how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And he says, if that's not true, if this instrument's not true, then eat, drink, and be, uh, be merry, for tomorrow you die. He says, we'd be false, we'd be false, false, uh, we're false witnesses. Uh, Christ be not risen, and our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Verse 16, or verse 17, Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. That's where and you say, well, what's the point? Well, you've got to have faith. That's where the faith comes in. You're betting your soul on a book, and if the book's true, then you're in, and if the book ain't true, you's out. And if the book ain't true, well, it sure was fun believing it. But there's no doubt in my mind that the book's true. Amen. There was no doubt in Paul's mind that the book was true. Yep. And, and, and like I said, these thoughts that will come to your mind, and it'll come, well, what makes, what makes Christianity different than all these other religions? And, and this, this thought come to me that Christianity, true Christianity, not just Christianity in name only to where they can cause anything, but by believing Christianity, salvation, the difference between Christianity and every other religion is Christianity is you don't have to do anything to get to heaven. Every other religion requires you to do something, good works, uh, Karma, uh, church membership, dying in a state of grace, the Catholic Church, uh, Hinduism, you know, making sure, making sure that you've, you know, you're, you've done a good enough works and you've got your, you've made sacrifices to your thousands of gods and then and hope for the best. Catholicism, you know, die in a state of grace, make sure you're baptized and hope for the best. Or Mormonism, and or you know do good works and believe this, believe that. But it all it comes down to all those false religions come to the Seventh Day Adventists, the Mormon Church, the Jehovah's Witnesses, all these other religions. It's based on you doing good works, making the good outweighing the bad to get to heaven. When it comes right down to it, when you boil it down. You know, on the surface it might not look like it, but it all it is all based on good works. Bible believing Christianity is the only religion to where you get to heaven because the founder died and rose again for you. That's the difference. That's the difference between this and every other religion. Amen. But you have to have faith, just like it says right there. You have to have faith, but if it didn't happen, your faith is vain. And so, Christian spatial disorientation. you got to be IFR, not VFR. And by IFR, I mean you got to know your instruments. No matter how you feel, you don't fly, you don't fly by the seat of your pants when it comes to Christianity. Because like the Apostle Paul says, you're in a spiritual battle where you don't know, you could wake up tomorrow, you could wake up tomorrow and, 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 and be in a totally different world as far as spirit, spiritual wise to where you feel, you don't feel saved anymore. I believe one of the biggest, the biggest ministries of the devil today is making lost people think they're saved and making saved people think they're lost. Amen. Because look at all these, and it goes back to those false religions to where they're, they're doing something 
to make themselves feel, well, I do this and I do that, I must be saved, I do this. You can't base your salvation on what you do, how you feel. You base it on what Jesus Christ did. And so if you're a newer Christian, don't fall into the trap of Christian spatial disorientation because you have been relying on your feelings rather than what the Word of God says. Just like it says in our first scripture, <coughs> uh, Romans 15, we'll end with this, read this again. Don't get comfort from how you feel. It says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Do our thing this day for you. Bless the service tonight. Help the and, and help the people rely on your word. Maybe they are. Maybe just like usual, I'm just preaching this to myself. But maybe there's someone in here who's uh, never simply trusted in what you did for him for salvation. Salvation's simple. It's quit trusting what you're doing, or quit trusting what they're doing, and trust what you already did for them. So, Lord, pray that uh, you bless everybody here tonight. Bless us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.